Welcome to Luftwaffe and Pilot with Penny Bradley. And today we are really blessed to have Kevin Estrella of Pyramids with Mar Pyramids on Mars with us. My mouth got all screwy. Um, anyway, he and his band are who made my theme song. So this is this is my good friend that I've known for what three years now, something like that. Three years at least. And we have vacation together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's seen me at my worst. <laughs> <laughs> and your best. <laughs> and my best. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyway, <clears throat> welcome to the show. You asked to be on today. You wanted to share something with the audience. Well, there's been uh, just uh, a lot of different things that have, you know, been developing. It's like an on ongoing story, you know, like, you know, from the last oh. time we spoke to, you know, where, where, where uh, I'm going and where things have been going and, and, uh, uh, you know, even even uh, the growth of uh, my my own radio show, Pyramids of Mars UFO Radio, uh, we hit uh, a monumental mark just a few months ago. Um, you did? Yeah, we did. Yeah, uh, my interview with Clifford Mahoudi marked my fiftieth um, my fiftieth guest on my show. Awesome! And I've, I've been doing it now for for uh, three years, which I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. But it's you know, been a grow, worldwide growing audience. Uh, you can find them, my radio show at uh, artistfirst.com. That's pretty easy to find. Just go to artistfirst.com and, and just look at the show and you'll see Pyramids on Mars UFO Radio. But, you know, we, we didn't, that, that show was created um, because of uh, Grant Cameron, actually. It was, uh, you know, the UFO researcher Grant Cameron. Um, you know, when the first I met him and he yeah, did his. I've, I've met him. Yeah. So when I did, when he did his first, when I saw him do his first presentation, you know, he said, you know, forget about the nuts and bolts. If you really want to know what's going on in the UFO community, you have to speak to the, the experiencers. The experiencers have the answer. And I, 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 you know, I was thinking, geez, wouldn't that be great to have a, a radio show that's dedicated to the experiencers? And then I was offered my own radio show three years ago, and you know, and and it's been that's what it's been about is giving them a voice. But, yeah, um, you had me on your show once. Yes, I yes I did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. And uh, but uh, you know, this year uh, really has really thrown everyone for a loop in regards to what's going on here on the planet. Uh, the whole planet's been hijacked because of this yeah, virus. Definitely. So this planet has been hijacked because of this virus. Um, anyone who thinks that this is virus is normal and that uh, it's a, a thing that happened, you're well, well not informed, and you really need to do you do your research and understand that this is part of a much larger agenda. And if you start looking and studying uh, Agenda 2030, you know, sustainable development, you'll understand where this is all going. Exactly. So, I've tried to explain that to my friends on social media is that if you read the documents for Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, the Rio Accords, and the Paris Accords, all of this was tied, was tied up, well-defined that this was going to happen. That's why so many of us were against these things. <clears throat> Not that we didn't want sustainability, but we don't want a new world order, total control with with no personal property, no personal anything. It was it's a program for complete control of the economy and all the individuals, and yeah. it's in the documents. If you if you read it surface level, it sounds really good. But if you really read the documents, it it lines it all out. I had hope for us when Trump 
um, pulled America out of the Paris Accords. But then I saw the same stuff come going down here that was going down in the rest of the world. So it's the same agenda. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> I'm filling in, filling in the blanks. Yeah, I'm glad you're filling in the blanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's been a really, really, you know, uh, personally for myself, it's been a really tough year because of trying to deal with, with all of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had, you know, plans for, you know, performing live with Pyramids of Mars this year. And, and obviously that was not going to be the case. So I had okay. to earn pages, you know, and, and, and figure out where things were going this year. And of trying to deal with what it ended up turning into was uh, a year of working on new music. A really tough year because that started to come together. Yeah. And that was, uh, that's where things started to go. Um, and so I started putting the focus on that, plus other things that were going on, personal things that were going on in my life of uh, rebuilding myself and, and reestablishing myself um, after a marriage breakdown. So um, that, that, was, that was pretty hard for you. Yeah, well, it was three, yeah, three years. It was three years in courts. Um, it was uh, endless, endless. Uh, the pain, I can't, can't even tell you what it was like. Um, I'd rather die than go through it again. I really would. There's no way I'd I've been through, through two divorces. Yeah. So you know what it's like. You know what it's like. Yeah. yeah. Um, the person who was supposed to be your best friend and have your back is suddenly trying to tear you apart. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I, um, you know, with all putting that all aside, um, some some uh, interesting uh, things kind of happened this year that were kind of unexpected because I wasn't really thinking about uh, a new album, but then it just happened to be that um, um, I started coming up with all these new song ideas, and these awesome. song these song ideas were just coming to me from the edge of the black. You know, like yeah, my, I remember you talking about the edge of the black. In fact, you titled the last album that. But it, if I remember correctly, um, it's it's that place that is beyond the normal astral area where creativity lives. Yes, yes. So when basically when you when you. Uh, uh, any creative artist, when you uh, whether it's writing music, whether it's painting, whether it's writing a book, when you when when you get into that creative flow, you're you're getting your your brain waves slow down into the, an alpha state, which becomes your highest telepathic state. And then what you're actually doing, and you're not even knowing this, is that you're actually tapping into the collective consciousness of all the other all the other beings out there in the universe, and you're kind of co-creating with them. It's still your voice, yet now you're hooked up to the and how uh, how the Ponty explained it to me, and that's that's down there. Hey, like my new poster. I love your new poster. I was noticing that. I you work, work, work for, for Tilcom. <clears throat> Tilcom, that's right. He's my boss. Just so people know, I work. Uh, for I work for Tiamat. Just in case people wondered. <laughs> okay. So, so they taught that the Ponte, they taught me about the edge of the black, which was uh, you go to the edge of the black of the universe, turn around and listen for the next song to be sung to you. And then you bring your own emotional interpretation to it. You sing, your, you sing the, the music with your full, full heart, and then you project that back out into the forever oceans. Okay? And so what was happening with this new music that I was writing and the process was already taking place um, at the edge, at the end of the edge of the black. When I was finishing that mm -hmm. album, I needed one more song to complete that album, and that song ended up being um, uh, Arcturian Rain. And if you listen yeah, to that is... song, that song, it's it's different, and and it's it's very bright sounding. It's got this high energy to it, but it's a very singing song. And it was the difference is because it was played on my signature guitar. Which is a very mm -hmm. guitar. It's uh, 
Actually, I'm going to go get it. I'll show you. Hang on. Okay. Yeah, my theme song is from his album, Edge of the Black. Yeah. Yes. So, so. this guitar here, this is my signature guitar. This guitar is, was, uh, um, he was designed by Alex Lyson of Rush. Okay? okay. So Alex actually designed this guitar. It's, um, there's only 500 of them made. This is the actual same model as his. It's the Aurora model, which has the three um, active single coils, which gives it this, it's like the super strat, the ultimate super strat guitar. It's got a very bright sound to it, different than a rock guitar. Um, and the music was just written from, you know, that this, this guitar wrote the, that song. And that, that song was written in one take, Arcturian Rain. The entire song was written in one take. Oh, and I know actually, it took you a long time to come up with Nachtwaffe, and you kept sending me um, variations. Yeah, that took so, a long time. There for for one for one song as beautiful as Arcturian Rain to come out in a single take, that's that's just incredible. So that, that's what happened with Arcturian Rain. It was written in one take. But here's the thing, Penny. Near, almost all the new music on my new album I'm working on were all written in one take. Really? Written in one. Every single song was written in one take. Yeah. So this has never wow. happened before. This has never happened before where I, where I picked up the guitar and the song just came to me and the whole entire structure of the song came in one take and I did not have to change the structure at all. It was perfect as it was. I had to go back and learn the songs as they were because they were given to me. Yeah. So, and these, these aren't like easy songs. There's like the changes are quite, there's a lot of changes that are going on in these songs, but they flow perfectly and they tell a story. And that's what it was. It was this, it was the guitar that was telling the story. It was the universe that was telling the story in the song. And, cool. um, you know, I listen to a lot, you know, like I hear a lot of instrumental rock guitar players. There's a lot of them out there. Yeah. But what, what turns me off from some of them is that they, they end up uh, sounding more like backing tracks for a guitar solo, if that makes any sense. It makes a There's lot of sense. Uh, yeah. I, I have issues with that kind of, of band at might as well be a solo player that hires stand-ins. Yeah, yeah, and like some of these guitar players, where it sounds like it's a platform for them to solo and show off you know their technical abilities or how great they can solo without any song development, like a a catchy melody, you know, um, or even the chord progression that's going on underneath the, the music, the actual song. Like I, I'll listen to these guys playing. And they're amazing, you know, they could do all that stuff, you know, and they're like they're like, you know, best players in the world. But what are they saying? You know, where's the song? And, you know, as a guitar player, I'm bored. I'm bored of that. I, I hate it. I can't stand it. You know, like, it's... I can understand so, that. Yeah, so like, I get bored of listening to guitar players so all the time because I want to hear the song. You know, I'm, I'm a guy who, like, listens to Rush, Led Zeppelin, Tool, you know. I want to hear a song. Song. You've heard what I listen to. It's everything from 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 Emerson Lake and Palmer. Yeah, you got me on Emerson Lake and Palmer. You know. Well, yeah, I I I do Emerson Lake and Palmer. I do Moody Blues. I do uh, Ramstein. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> I do the Who, H U yeah. from Mongolia, as well as the Who. W H O from England. <laughs> yeah, I love when you post music, yeah, because like, you you got you have really good taste. I really love it. Seriously. Well, what I you love do? your music, so you know. Okay. <laughs> that works out pretty good. You know, <laughs> so, uh, you're, so you're, you are the the first and so far only rock star to have ever written a song for me. And I, here it is, two years later, and I'm still jazzed as hell. 
<laughs> so well, guess what? There's another one that's coming. <laughs> There's not Wampa Part Two on this album. <laughs> is there really? I yes, there I is. have not heard that one yet. So yeah, you have not heard this one yet. Yeah, this one is. Uh, let's put it this way: it's one of those songs that. I've got to keep cranking it because it sounds better when you turn it up. And uh, then I had my neighbor downstairs banging on my door at 11 o'clock at night saying, can you please turn your music down? So, but dude, Head it's not, <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> oh, I, uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, one of the new songs on the album, once again, the song was written in one take and it was perfect, absolutely perfect. And it was heavy. This freaking awesome riff, this amazing riff on my uh, Les Paul guitar, and uh, the song. That song is called uh, Luff, Luff Ponzer, Air Tanks. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So it's. I, uh, I'm going to have to buy this one. Yes, I've bought two of your albums. I still have to buy the third one. Well, this this song is. Uh, I'm really excited about this song, Luff Ponzer. It's uh, very toolish. It sounds very much like tool. So okay. that's that. Um, the other cool thing about the new music that I'm writing is that, um, for, like, the bass is very important to me in the in the music, and that's another thing that. Kind if you don't of have a if you don't have a bass, you don't have a song. I'm sorry. This is like my personal taste in music. Yeah, yeah. Like the bass, I got to hear the bass, and I find that that's the. Other it uh, sometimes turns me off of uh, instrumental rock music, rock guitar music, is that the bass is just buried in the mix. So it just sounds like the bass is playing the same thing as the guitar, so you don't even hear any bass. So it's, once yeah. again, the music is very two-dimensional. You know, I want to hear the bass. You know, like when you listen to Led Zeppelin, you hear John Paul Jones. You know, yeah. you, you hear and you, you, any Rush song, you hear Getty and you hear Alex. It sounds like a an orchestra because there's, you know, the bass is carrying. Uh, this is just as important as the guitar, and the same and thing in the band tool. Band is supposed to be a team that works together, not a star with a backup group. Exactly. That's one exactly. of the things I I look for in music, is is the band a unit. Or is there it is. a star with the backups, with backup players? Exactly. And I look for that unit, and <clears throat> I need drums. I need guitars where you have a melody and a bass, and if they have a harpsichord or a synthesizer or flutes, I'm in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not necessary, but you know, um, there are days when I pull, I go through YouTube and I ask for, I I put it put it in the top harpsichord music. <laughs> That's nice. So, um, oh, oh, you gotta check out. Oh, what's his name? I think his name is. Uh... Jean, Jean, oh, I can't remember, he's French. Anyway, all his music is just nothing but harpsichord. And he, he has an old, like, 16, 1700s harpsichord with all the original painting inside it. And it's oh. double harpsichord, and he plays nothing but, like, Bach and that. And he sets up in old, old houses and stuff, and he plays beautifully. you got to check this guy out. I'll try to send you some links. I, okay. I, oh my God, I've, I've listened to this for hours on YouTube, listening to him play the harpsichord. Absolutely pristine. I will send you the links. He's just God. He's just amazing. <laughs> he takes the, he brought the harpsichord back to life in the 21st century. It's just, oh. Well, he, my listeners know I've been doing my family tree, and when I got to, um, <clears throat> the Dukes of Anjou. <laughs> uh, one of them was the first troubadour who was 
basically royalty. He was, they were not supposed to have jobs because their job was to manage the country, but he wrote poetry in Occitan, the native language rather than Latin, and set it to music, and he played the lute. And um, oh, mm. it's mostly sex music. <laughs> <laughs> It is, I'm being honest. But when I found him in my my um, family tree, Gilliam the Tenth Banjo, um, I decided to see if somebody had played any of his music because it's still you know, it's it's there. We we still have copies of what was written and the notation uh, for the music. And so I found this guy in southern France who was recording it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I spent days listening to this. Drove Lou absolutely batshit. <laughs> he finally, when I finally went back to rock and roll, he was like, Phew. <laughs> <laughs> But it was like immersing myself in, in, what my ancestor had written. Nice. And yeah, so. th that was a lot of the reason why I did the family tree was my grandparents had basically cut off our roots. So they lied about who we were, where we were from. And to be honest, my father has very dark skin that is incompatible with the family tree as it's presented. Huh. Still is. I have not yet found where he got his dark skin. So um, that's, you know, none of the stories they told us said why daddy was was dark. And I mean dark, he's, he's dark like Native American, purebred. So um, he looked like David Jansen from The Fugitive, old actor, black and white version. <laughs> But he, but he had dark skin like he was Native American or Hispanic. And, uh, you know, two of my siblings do too. And it's, it's looking at this and going, hmm, where did that come from? <laughs> because he used to say, well, I'm Irish. And we'd go, black Irish? <laughs> We used to tease him for, for, for months when he would bring it up. Well, I'm Irish. Oh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so knowing that the stories didn't match the physical is what drove me to do the tree. And all of my family went, you know, my, my mom, because my father died in 1980, my mom went, went crazy. My grandparents went crazy. It was, no, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And Marilyn and why, and it's too late because I've already done it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah. I found out who we were, and it, we're related to all of those people everyone loves to hate. <laughs> so, but yeah. Anyway. I love your music. So when is this new album coming out? I'm, I'm expecting it to uh, come out the um, um, in, uh, in uh, the, the springtime of 2021. Okay. Yeah. But there was there was something else that uh, a couple other uh, strange twists that took place with this album that are very important too. Um, so once there's like, like the one being that I said that the majority of the music, almost 80, 90% of it was all written in one take. So that's completely different than anything that's ever happened to me before. That's never happened mm -hmm. before. So it's a real stream of consciousness. And I think it was, it's cause kind of a, a new level of where, I'm, where things are going. So I took yeah. edge of the black, you know, of streaming from the edge of the black. And now it's like, okay, now we're going to take it to the next level of stream mm -hmm. of conscious songs and the songs are just going to come in one piece which i think is 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 great because it really gets back to telling a story it's, it's about the song it's about you know the actual song speaking not a 
not a backing track so a guitar player can solo, you know. Yeah. And like I really, it, it was a real struggle working with this new album because the mix was different. Um, because of the the mid, like half the half this album, I'm using the signature guitar, and it's a different, brighter sound. The other great thing about this album is that, as I was explaining, we we're talking about bass and why a bass is so important to me. I actually managed to get a hold of this year. Everything lined up, and I actually purchased myself a 1976 Rickenbacker, the actual bass that Getty Lee. I remember when you posted that on your wall that you were so jazzed. So I am so I absolutely that's bass that I've always loved. I love that sound, and that's the sound that I wanted to have in my music. And I finally am doing it. And this album, I exploit the shit out of that Rickenbacker. Now the other <laughs> cool thing is that the the songs are so different because half so half the album I'm using the the signature the other half of the album i'm using my les paul guitar now the difference is the les paul is where the music came from to that why on that guitar and what happened with that guitar so this is what happened penny it was like back in march and i go and pick the, my pick up my les paul and i've got it already tuned low okay it's, it's like a d tuned guitar so you take the low e string you tune it down to the note d so that yeah. it's like an open or D, A, D are the last four strings. Tool play in an open D chord. It was really popular back in the uh, in the uh, late 90s. You know, like bands like Soundgarden and we're doing it too. But then I take that tuning and then I tuned it down a whole other step to low C. So, and that's what I used to play in in my old band Shatter Instinct. It's very low sounding. But one day I pick up the guitar and it sounded so rich and I just started writing this this new music was just coming out in this guitar all in one take. And, um, and, and then I, I decided to check the tuning on the guitar. It was like, I don't remember my guitar ever sounding like this low. And it wasn't tuned to low C. It was tuned another whole step and a half lower to low A. It was a baritone setting. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here? I but didn't it, tune it this. It sounded great. It well, sounded amazing. Well, but I have visitors. I have visitors. And I checked the tuning, even the frequency, because I tuned to 432 hertz. It yeah. wasn't even at 432, because the tuning was, was A, halfway A sharp. It wasn't even like, I was like, what's going on here? Like, it, and it, it was completely messed. It took me two days to figure out what the tuning was in my guitar. And when I, I, I downloaded a... a, a, a frequency generator so I can mm -hmm. pinpoint frequency of what he what the guitar was tuned to and it was tuned to 528 hertz solfeggio frequency that's the heart frequency yes yeah 528 heart hertz. heart chakra frequency yes guys I'm not new age but yes I do know this stuff <laughs> yeah thank you and I found out that it was Grayson, my Ponte friend, who kind of looks like Telcom. It was yeah. Grayson who put up his hand and said, we thought you, you'd like to experiment in a different tuning. And he retuned my guitar. I couldn't believe it. He had and retuned your guitar to the heart frequency. He tuned it to the heart frequency, but he also tuned it to a baritone setting. So mm -hmm. baritone guitar, the strings are so low; they were actually almost flapping, and they and they uh, they go out of tune if you hit them too hard. I had to go and buy a heavier gauge set of strings, almost a jazz set of strings, so that it would stay in the intonation for that low tuning because the guitar is not technically built for that. You usually, have to go and buy a baritone guitar to play at a baritone low, but I didn't. He just played around with it, and I got this great sound. And the guitar is so freaking low, and really the, the, that that consciousness frequency of 528, it's different, and you hear it, you feel it in the music. It's so cool. And I wrote and the other half of the music on this album was all written on that guitar. So this album is literally music from another world. When you listen to it, it's actually coming from another world because it was tuned by extraterrestrials. 
That's amateur. that's amazing. That's really amazing. Like who who can claim that? Who can claim you. that? <laughs> now I understand that that some of the bands from my generation uh, had ET influences, uh, Moody Blues in particular. And that's why they have that other world feel to a lot of their music. So, um, in fact, that was what attracted me to listening to them was that that you I almost go out of body listening to some music. Uh, you noticed while we were playing the theme music, I was rocking out to it. Well, when you hit I the yeah, I saw you doing that too. Um, yeah, when you hit the parts where you're using the tonal language in it, I, oh, I, I have to struggle to stay in my body because I feel myself back out in space in the ships. Yeah. And uh, I still don't know how, how, how the hell you do that on a guitar. <laughs> I don't know how I did it either. I don't know. Is it repeatable? Can you play it? Oh, I can play it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can play it. Um, it's it's just when I wrote it, it was what was going on consciously. That was how what happened. Why why it sounds the way it did? Because if you listen to it. It's the notes are the the bends are like only like a half a bend. They're not even a full bend. They're just it's just yeah. hypnotic. It's just it, it's, it sounds it sounds like a whale. You know, it's like it's undescribable. And uh, are, uh, are it, you it, using the tonal language on the new album? Um, I don't know yet. I don't know. Um, I'm hoping to. I'm really hoping that I can capture some of it on this new album. Um, I've been talking with Sue Walker, and she was translating for for uh, for for Drudy. Actually, I had a conversation with Drudy, and Drudy told me that she was talking with Fira over in the New Zealand uh, underwater base, and they're talking about picking me up in one of their um, submersible uh, skipper ships to go and converse with the whales so that I can learn more of the tonal language. So, and she and that Sue said be. that knows this is the first time that that station has ever they, they've decided that they're going to take a, a Twitter follower from this far away to do such a thing. So, I'm still waiting for that. Well, you're for that. You're not exactly just a Twitter follower. No. You're one, no. You're one of the people involved in, in the official first contact event. Yes, I am. Yes, and I was told that too. I was told that too. Um, a lot of revelations uh, came to me this year from the ponty of, of, uh, of what I'm going to be doing. So I've been mentally preparing myself for quite a long time and um, you know, because we we are representing humanity on behalf of the star nations mm -hmm. I'll, I'll repeat that we as myself and people like you we are representing humanity on behalf of the star nations that is a very very big responsibility yeah so, it is any time yeah. that you're representing humanity in interactions with star nations or anything else out there, you're no longer just you. You are representing all of us, and you have to keep that in mind. Yeah, and we have to we have to be right minded in what we say, mm -hmm. and in our words and our and our energies, and yeah. you know. You do an amazing job that way too, because of how much, you know, how much people attack you, and yet you are still the ship that still s doesn't sink, doesn't sink, and doesn't sway, and is is calm, and knows how to 
get through the waves and gently. And I, I mean, everything that you say, you know, and I know, I, I know, so you know the way that you write, and and how diplomatic you're like the mother, you know, <laughs> children. Now stop waving your wings in each other's face. Angels, stop waving your wings in each other's faces. That's kind of like how you talk to them, you know. You hear Lou laughing. <laughs> Isn't it true, though? All the uh, I sometimes I sometimes yell at the angels, um, <laughs> but yeah, they, the humans. I I try to stay on an even keel because I understand. I am very aware they don't really understand. They, until you've experienced interactions with an ET in a physical body, you're standing there with someone in front of you who is a someone, another person, but their body is so different the shock value you have to get past that to actually do the work and uh, a lot of people have trouble with that initial shock value i see that as being the most likely problem for for official first contact is that initial shock value because they a lot of the people in my 3D real world have trouble dealing with someone from another skin col color or another language, much less somebody that doesn't even look human. Exactly, and I, you know, I, and I've met, I've, I've heard many, you know, UFO, you know, people in the UFO world, you know, researchers who have referred to, you know, you know, the ETs that look human, they're they're. They're they're normal, but anyone who, who does look, who looks different, they're an alien. And you know, it's like, okay, so a place well, to <laughs> the ones who there. look human, the ones who look most like us are the most dangerous. <laughs> there you go. That's my experience out in space. If they look like us, you better be leery of those people. If they don't look like us, they're usually nice guys. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather have a Sasquatch as a friend than own a gun. You know, honestly. <laughs> you'd be safer too. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But uh, that's the other thing that I was going to get into was because uh, uh, you bring you bring up a good point in regards to what people expect from official first contact or even with interactions with with extraterrestrials as I had um, uh, a family member recently uh, I, I had sent them a link to my interview with Mike Patton uh, Mike Patterson from Sasquatch Ontario okay. and and I sent a link to his website and where he has you know audio recordings of of Neff, his uh, Sasquatch friend, you know, talking out in the background. You can hear him and, and throwing, you know, throwing stones just, and all the pictures talking. of the of the just talking. It's just him talking, you know, and him saying, you know, like, you know, I love you, Mike. Like he said, I love you, Mike. You know, you know, it's like calling out Mike's name. And so my family member said, well, anybody can do that. Have you ever heard Mike? You know, have you heard um, you know Mike Patton from uh, the singer from Faith No More, his solo albums? He can make, he can change himself to sound like a like a like a Sasquatch. I don't believe any of this. This could be faked any time. I said, well, I said go check out his other stuff on his website, you know, because he's got lots of other evidence. And without even batting an eye, he responds back and says, no, I don't want any of that. I want I want to be there. I want you. I want you to take me. I want. I want. I want to be there. I want to see it myself with my own eyes. And nothing will convince them till they see it with their own eyes, and even then they'll think that they were hallucinating. Yeah, I told him, I said, that's not how it works. I said, you know, you can't go and demand them to make their presence. You know, I said, you have to make contact well, with them. Some you of us make can. <laughs> some of us can sometimes. 
um, <clears throat> our friend Kale is pretty good at, at producing tall lights. <laughs> oh, yeah. But he <laughs> also invites them, though. Like, he, you yeah. know, he, he's invited them. He's CE5. He's, it's these other people who don't want to do the work. They demand them to, to reveal themselves. And it's like, that's not how it works. I said, you know, I, and I told them straight out. They said, you know, I, I said, I've given, you know, people contact me all the time. I ask, how can I have contact with ET? And I tell them the same thing every single time. I said, if you want to contact, easiest thing to do, go to officialfirstcontact.com, download the Telepathy 101 primer, practice okay. a half day for 100 days on your telepathy and inviting them to see you, and you will have contact. I said, that's called C5 protocol. You need to make the initiative to contact them. And I'll tell you why I'll say that, because I have, do it all the time, make the effort to invite them to come oh. visit me. And what do they do? They show up every single time. They show yep. up here. They and show they up. And it's happened more oh. this year. I've had so many visitations from star nations this year. It's, it's incredible, because I ask them, please, I want to meet you and they show up yeah they do um i've stopped so much asking as i had so many different groups coming in that i needed a little more space between them does that make sense and yeah. one of the beings who came to Li basically live with me um, <clears throat> is a Naga and they don't get along well with Zeta types and so the Punti have stopped visiting me because he's here oh. and uh, well Peter had been the one that had visited me before and he he knew uh, at the time I was quite ill and dying and I had I did die and got sent back and I didn't know why I was dying and he broke protocol to tell me what I was doing wrong and he got into a awful lot of trouble for that and he hasn't been back I appreciate so much that he told me what was the matter um, it was, I have pernicious anemia, and I was taking a pill form of B12 instead of taking the sublingual. And that was the problem. And I actually had both bottles sitting in the house, and he showed me the one I was taking, and he says, bad. Showed me the other kind and said, good. <laughs> and that's huh. all he did. And he got into terrible trouble over that because he was breaking protocol. I didn't uh, know that. Interfering in my destiny. <clears throat> At least that's what I got told about it through my sources. And oh. uh, I feel really bad he got in trouble for it because he was. it was just sheer kindness on his part. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate what he did don't do that kind of thing because you know even with sue and otter in their situations um i'm sure that they could heal otter from his uh his uh you know because he, he lost part you know one, one third of his hand from a from a grenade mm -hmm. blowing off and he, and he lives his entire life with this with this shaking you know yeah and uh, nerve damage and pain and uh and phantom phantom fingers um but you know, the, the Ponte, you know, they, they're not, inter they can't interfere, or whatever not protocol. Like inter interfere. And I was so grateful that, that PETA helped me, and I felt so bad that he got in trouble for it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's a, uh, go ahead. Well, I'm going to say others 
showing up and and they um, some of them are not friendly uh, some of them are I have a job I do in I don't know I don't know if it's dimensional or, or what level it's at but I have a job a function that I perform and some of the some of the people used loosely <laughs> Um, who show up are upset about decisions I've made and so um, I get a lot of criticism mm -hmm. my contact my contact is not always pleasant but mm -hmm. they're not out to physically harm me so I will yeah. say that it's it's they want a different choice made and sometimes they're right that I didn't take everything into consideration. So I do listen to them. Yeah. Um, well, I've uh, I've had a lot of visitations this year because I initiated the protocol and initiated the invitations, and I've I've met a lot of amazing um, star nations this year. Uh, one of them being. Um, who I wrote a song about, who's on the new album, her name's Flaley, and she is this um, blue um, figure, because it was, it was, it was our, our friend, once again, who talked to his tall white and, and knew who she was, and the best we could get was that she is Arcturian's peoples, so she is a blend of okay. Arcturian and because she has these um, cat eyes, she has these beautiful amber bioluminescent glowing cat, cat eyes blue skin and she's got a, a pot you know a head just like this like mm -hmm. Rudy kind of goes to a point the Arcturians tend to be blue or purple and physically resemble the Ponte yeah and their and her head kind of goes like like almost like a foot a football at the back mm -hmm. the reason I know that is because I touched the back of her head it was, it was really cool it was wild, mm -hmm. um, but she also has this kind of a, this bone at the back of her neck, or the bone of her skull, which is almost kind of straight. It was like almost felt like a brick, like on the size of a brick. Uh, it was very different the, the the structure of her back of her head. But I touched the back of her head, you know, and uh, it was it was it went to like a point. But she's just this beautiful woman, and she's so energetic. She must have been like only in her twenties, and uh, she laughed. She had this beautiful laugh, you know. And um, and so I, she she visited, and then uh, just yesterday, just yesterday, last night I um, I asked for two things. I, I gave out two C two C five protocols, and they both happened that night. They both happened. The one was I asked the Sasquatch if they would visit me in my dream, if they would just you know say hello, and the mm -hmm. other thing I asked. Because I wanted to see Flaley, Flaley again. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is what happened. Right. Um, I dreamt I had a dream, and in one of these dreams, I was somewhere. It looked like I was in Oregon, and it was very hilly and lots of forests and pines and stuff. And it was it was a full moon, and I and there was rocks and stuff. And then I saw this huge across the street. I saw this very tall, fourteen foot. Uh, tall Sasquatch who was, you know, standing over there and is, you know, acknowledging acknowledging me. First time uh -huh. I've ever had a, a, a dream with a Sasquatch in it. And there was actually two Sasquatch in that dream, and that was just so cool. And I remember that dream. The next thing that happened was I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and that's usually when I, when, my, when I wake up after a good rest and then I go back to sleep, that's when I'm usually having the, visit the visitations of star nations who will visit mm -hmm. in a loose state, in an altered state of consciousness. Yeah, they, they like to come at that time where I guess we have plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah, you can call it that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's also like they like to visit in that safe zone of uh, altered consciousness, which is a lucid state, a lucid dream state, but it's, but it's it's not a dream because okay. because you they paralyze you first of all you don't get paralyzed when you're sleeping you actually i got physically paralyzed 
they also will induce you um, you know, if you're half asleep and you're close enough to it, they'll just kind of basically go like this and kick you, kick you into the dream. You know, it's like, okay, he's close enough for pulling him in, and they'll do that. They'll induce you, uh-huh. and so, uh-huh. and so, yeah, this is. This uh, is what I, I've had that, yes. Yeah, uh, I have had that. Um, in fact, last night I had a visitation, a, a, a chat with one of with the head of the local guardian group, and. Okay. I can't remember everything that she said, and I'm kicking myself for that. But the gist of it was that there's going to be a lot of information about DNA coming out in the public, and that the public's going to need help understanding it. Okay. So, yeah. Interesting. She talked to me for hours, and that's what I remember. <laughs> so. All right. Cool. Okay, cool. <clears throat> well, yeah, I was basically going to get back to what happened uh, yesterday morning, because I had asked for a visitation from Flaley, and then um, and then I drew, uh, last night, at you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm trying to get back asleep, and then I was quickly induced into an, an altered state. But this time, um, I found myself immediately, I was on board a ship, and I was in my astral body, okay. because we're kind of jumping ahead here, but another thing that's happened to me this year is that I've learned to astral travel, okay? Cool. Uh, and remember it. And remember it, and that, remember that, how to, how to that, do it. That that's the big part. A lot of people can astral travel; they just don't remember it. So that's the biggie. Yes. So I'm remembering this because I've astral traveled now um, at least half a dozen times. First three times that happened, I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know what was going on. I had to do research, and then when I was reading about the, you know, finding out about what they described what it was like the electrical of your body and the mm-hmm. physical body. Falling out backwards and flying really fast, and you're 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 not asleep. That's when I realized that I was astral traveling, and so now I've been working on it. I'm actually taking a course, learning how to do it more, and getting more and more comfortable with the process of of, of leaving my body and, and, and creating that electrical field, which I know that I'm actually physically just separating. So I immediately was in my astral body, and I was on board this ship, and it had it was white walls. Um, almost like um, molded pillars into the side of this of this of this big ship, very very tall, very very tall, and uh, then I felt myself I was floating, and and uh, then I felt myself I was traveling down this hallway. It was almost like a like a like a, a vertical or horizontal elevator, you know, and I'm flying down this elevator at tremendous speeds that I'm almost I'm almost dizzying. It felt like I was going 100 miles an hour flying down this, this tube. And then I come to the end of this tube and this big blue glass that's in front um, that looks like a, like a TIE fighter, uh, the front of a TIE fighter, you know, the, the glass mm-hmm. kind of like, and then it opens and I walk in and it must be like 50 foot tall ceilings, once again the same kind of molding walls. It was only about 20 feet, uh, it was narrow. And then I saw Three blue beings in white tile, uh, white uniforms um, over there, and then um, one of them approached me. I couldn't see they, they 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 blocked their faces, but I could still I could see I could see their blue skin, very dark blue skin. And and then one of them approached me, and then she she gave me a hug, and I'm sure that it was Thera or, or Flaley. I'm sure it was Flaley. It had to be. So uh, and then I, I immediately I was back I was back uh, back in bed, you know. But uh, uh, we we have a listener wants to ask questions. You sure. you ready for that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Katie, let Chet Goldstein join us. Hello there. How's it going, everyone? Good. How are you? I'm wonderful. Things are going well here, too. Nice. Uh, my producer said you had questions. 
Oh, I didn't. I didn't have any questions. <clears throat> oh, you just wanted to say hi. Okay. Yeah, I was just joining the the live stream was kind of being a little weird, so it was hard to. It was lagging out for me, so I figured I'd join the meeting so I could see it better. Uh, if that's okay, if I can leave if you want me to. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm sitting here with your penny. And hey, what's up, Kevin, bro? Love you, Kevin. All right, Chet, you just mute yourself and let them go. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you were you were on this ship, and and you were there astrally. Um, have you noticed that the have you noticed how much different the physics is when and whenever you're you're astral? Definitely. The one thing that uh, that that really stands out with the physics of when I'm in an astral when I'm in, when I'm astral traveling is my balance, my sense of balance. So mm -hmm. I know I like my sense of balance is really really more sensitive. Like I'll know if I'm upside down or whether I'm right side up, and that for me is uh, the key that I know that I am in the astral because it's more because I, I that, that when the first time that it happened to me. Um, I was basically, I was like spinning in space, going, you know, tumbling in space, and I could feel myself going upside down, right side up, upside down, right side up, like I had a good sense of balance, but I didn't have a body, and I wasn't asleep, and I was thinking, okay, why am I not dreaming? Where the heck am I? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the first couple times, like, this astral travel happened, um, that was the first time. The, the, the time that it really struck me was... Uh, I was really tired one night, and so I took a melatonin to try and get to sleep. And I'm lying there in bed. It was after midnight, and I'm really, really tired. And I, I basically, I'm at the point where I'm kind of watching myself fall asleep. So it's like I could feel mm -hmm. my body getting tired. I could feel my body starting to get this tingly sensation. And I could feel my brain was almost like uh, it was relaxing, and I could feel this pressure that was building up in my pineal gland. And I'm thinking, oh, great, I'm close to getting asleep. I'm almost asleep. Oh, thank God. But the thing was, you don't do that when you're, when you're sleeping. You're like, you're, you're, you're unconscious and you're not conscious. Yeah. I was watching myself fall asleep. And then immediately, yeah. I, you know, I'm at the point of falling asleep. And then, and then this, the pressure builds up in my pineal gland. And there was this explosion. And the next thing I know, I'm plummeting out the back of my body, traveling downwards. Like if I had fallen, like if I had done a, a back flip off of a off of a cliff, and doing a dive, but it was a, but multiply that to get it going a hundred miles an hour, like that, and I could feel I've the done that. back of my head, and I'm flying really fast. It was amazing. It was so incredible, and then all of a sudden I became paranoid because I realized I'm not sleeping. What is going on? What's going on here? <laughs> and I. I felt like I was, I wasn't close to my body, so I decided to go check on myself. And next thing I know, I'm still flying out there, but I go mm -hmm. and check on my body. I'm, I could feel my covers. I could hear everything in my bedroom. I could hear the fans going. I could hear myself breathing. But it was like if I was awake. You, you're you're not that conscious when you're actually doing when, when you're when you're asleep. I was actually yeah. hearing myself in my bed. And I was thinking, how could they be in two places at the same time? What's going on here? The other uh, thing is the reason I did that. You don't want to. You don't want to ask. <laughs> okay. How, how can you? How can you do the, both at once? Uh, it's like you split, and there's like a rope between you out there and the body laying there. Yeah, they so, call it the silver. Yeah. Yeah, you have. Um, it's called a silver cord. Uh, with UFO abductions, with SSP experiences. I don't get why they think that's cool. Um, you're interacting with something so outside the norm that talking about it automatically puts a label on you in most people's minds. You're, you're setting yourself apart for scorn. So I don't understand why these people think it's so important to be 
public and famous. I'm sharing what I know to be true in the hopes that we can get the worst of the abuses out of the system. And uh -huh. that would be the CIA kidnapping children to serve in black ops for the rest of their lives. That should be stopped. Now, as far as, as extraterrestrial contacts and even some interdimensional contacts, those are things that should be encouraged. Yeah. There are some races out there who are dangerous, and people should know who they are. Um, and be aware that everybody out there thinks they're good guys. Nobody says, I'm the bad guy. So you have to, you have to be friendly and open, but still pay attention and protect yourself. There has to be a balance there. Because you wouldn't leave your front door unlocked when you go to bed. Same idea. There are bad people on Earth. There are bad people in space. But they are individuals. You have to give the race a fair hearing. But understand everybody out there in 3D has an agenda. And that that's the fair hearing part you listen yeah, yeah. to them you get to know them you find out what they're about but you don't broker any deals until you know what their agenda is <laughs> so yeah. um i mean we vacation together one year so you are completely aware i have interaction on an ongoing and regular basis. And that's one of the things we have in common is we both interacted with some of the same beings. And uh -huh. I, I think that's just completely awesome that I have someone I can talk to who knows, yes, it's real, no, I'm not crazy. And uh -huh. neither are you. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I was, I was quite honored when uh when we uh, were staying with Misha Johnson and our friend Kale was there and Misha, um, her, her reptilian protector, Iano, showed up and um, that. Kale, saw, Kale saw him and Misha actually broke into tears when she saw him. I couldn't see him because I was sitting on the other side of the, the far couch so I couldn't see down the hallway where mm -hmm. cause she was in her bedroom and I could hear him. I could hear him moving around in her bedroom. I couldn't see him. And Kale told me, sit, don't move. Don't, don't move. And I said, okay, no problem. So, um, but I heard him and then when Misha saw him, she started to cry because she hadn't seen him in a long time. And the reason why he showed up was because he felt that somebody had hurt Misha and he was really worried about her. Somebody had physically hurt Misha, and he was really upset. Well, what had happened was that Misha had actually gone for eye surgery that day. Mm, and she had a... Yeah. She, and and she he had knew had. that... Yeah, somebody had hurt her, and he was upset, and that's why he came over. So that was... You know, to actually be there to witness that was was incredible. That was incredible. Uh, yeah. It was also was, um, you know, I got a... Um, uh, a four days uh, brain brain surgery uh, course in that Wapa because of Penny Bradley. Yeah. Um, my... <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be honest. Um, by the end of the first day, he had told me to shut up. <laughs> that he had enough, too much, and I was sitting there going, "Oh shit! How did I miss that he was getting overloaded?" <laughs> Uh, because I, I was so bad. I I didn't say anything, but it was it was by the end of the night, and we decided we were gonna, we, we watched uh, Iron Sky Iron Skies Part Two, and um, and you kept narrating the whole thing, and I got to the point because I just wanted to drink and get drunk and just watch the movie, and I didn't want to learn anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, Kale and I were sitting there, blow by blow, 
everything in the movie we were telling how it was real and, and what this means and what this means i'm like i just want to watch the fucking movie <laughs> no more education after after uh you and kale went on uh to new mexico um i spent half a day with misha and i asked her you know was i really that bad in my little girl whiny voice <laughs> and she says you can go from surface to deep in under 10 seconds and i'm like oh shit <laughs> uh, yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah on my show i try to stay you know not too deep because i i have a lot of listeners who this will be the first time they've ever heard me so they have no background whatsoever and I'm inviting my friends on you know um, I think I've only had to go scrounging for a guest once because somebody didn't didn't show up and didn't tell me until the last minute and uh, so I pulled in um, I pulled in the guy that does my counseling, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so he he did a great job. In fact, they kept him for the next show. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, that was Gabriel Hackney, and uh, I I met him in the Anuna community, um, and those are the people who believe they are fractal incarnations of Anunnaki and they have abilities and uh, I expected him to talk about Anunnaki and instead he talks about Buddhism <laughs> uh, okay uh, yeah this was this was yeah but I haven't had to go hunt people um, you asked me to be on this one um, most of the people are happy to come back um, so I must be doing something right. I know I shift altars during them. And uh, you may start off talking to one version of me, and by the end of the show, you've talked to three or four. Hmm. And um, there's a couple of repeat guests that, that they take bets on how many times I'm going to shift altars during the interview. <laughs> so... <Yeah. clears throat> um, yeah, so that's why I jump around subjects a lot, is because it's not really me. <laughs> oh, okay. That explains it. <laughs> yeah, that explains it. I'm shifting alters, and it's not, not the me that started the video. So, um, fortunately... Well, that's, that's that happens so much when we were on vacation. That explains it. I think that totally explains it. Because we'd be talking about something, and all of a sudden, you're, you're off on a different tangent. And I'm like, where did this come from? What's going on? Where? I have <laughs> 2,200 altars. I have reintegrated 31 of them. I have a hell of a lot more to go. Uh, the last one, the CIA got mad and broke my shoulder and told me not to do it again. And I haven't because it hurts so bad and even after having having reconstruction surgery a year ago I still have to have help dressing so um, I can't my left shoulder will not function well enough for me to be able to dress or undress by myself so I have to Lou, ha Lou is being paid to be my caregiver and that's I'm honest about it. Um, <clears throat> I figure I've been honest about everything else. I should be honest about that, too. Um, I have altars. I was working on them. The CIA got mad. They broke my shoulder. Now I can't even dress myself. And it's, it's I mean, you saw how disabled I actually was there and add the altars on top of it and it makes sense why every place I've ever worked they told me I was weird so yeah I'm a mess 
and the, and SSP is why. If I had never been taken by the CIA, I would be a single individual in my body and I would have all of my abilities without constantly shifting and I wouldn't have people looking over my shoulders. Um, I wouldn't be being shot at. So I personally blame the CIA for this and if I can bring them down, I will. Yeah. So, uh, when I say that I have more issues with the CIA than I do with ETs, I'm being honest. The Draco mm -hmm. were kinder to me than the CIA was. That's my personal uh -huh. experience. I happen to to have a lot of respect for the Draco. Um, I don't know. And uh, I still have interaction with the Queen Mother. And uh, I have a whole contingent of, of her personal guards that are staying with me. Mm. So um, that's part of my protection system. And I've had people read me without my consent and tell me all kinds of crap about, oh, you're surrounded by Draco. Well, yeah, they're my guards. They've been here for, what, three, four years now? <laughs> Since I went public, I've had, I've had Draco guards. And huh. I've had orc guards. And I've got Yes, I've got a Sia car. Yes, um, I've got my Sia car because Tiamat is the head of the council that keeps me on my mission. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is the symbol. It's a solar cross. And it's the symbol of my family. So, um, that's. Oh, you too. Hang on. <clears throat> the solar cross was my Christmas present, and I'm wearing it early. <laughs> All right. I got something here that's uh, quite dear to me. That sits on top of my amplifier. Oh, yes. I got you that when we were on vacation in Vegas together. Great. You burn incense and the smoke comes out all the dragon mouths. Yes, if I had incense, the smoke would come out of the dragon's mouths. <laughs> but yes, this sits on top of my amplifier. And you see it in some of my music videos. And I thank you very much for this. It really means a lot to me. Ben. Well, when I saw it, I knew you would love it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are friends for, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, so, yeah. That, that, sign that, that sign that you got, that you told me I should buy about Starfleet officers only. <laughs> That's on our, our front door. <laughs> I am. <laughs> now the landlady looks at a little odd, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. But, you know, that's mostly of what I wanted to share with you is, uh, you know, mostly regarding what's happened uh, music wise and where this new album, the new album uh, direction is going. Uh, this this uh, change of consciousness, this, this uh, flow of consciousness and and um you know the continuous telepathic development of, of, of my music and um i'm hoping that more of the whale music more of the tonal language is going to come in with this uh, new music there's a lot there's a lot of powerful a lot of powerful things that are going on in these new songs that need to be heard you know particularly that song I, that i dedicated to flaley um uh, that one is really bleeding but you have to be at the right level of 
vibration to for it to feel it to understand what's going on very sad song um and the premise of that song is basically why do we have to you know why do we have to wait you know to you know call out to extraterrestrial to help rescue us from our planet that's going to go you know we're going we're going to face an extinction level event and we have to and we have to cry out for their help well, I was going to ask you about that because you've mentioned that on your wall and in the Sandia Mountain Group. And um, so there's been a, there's been a, I don't want to call it prophecy exactly, but a prediction of something's happening. Where did you get this information? Bonte are monitoring. They have been closely monitoring this planet for a long time. It's it's um, it's it's also been written about in our ancient books, but it's also uh, there's nothing that we can do about it. They've known about it for a long time. Uh, star nations have known about it, and um, it's it has a lot to do with where the planet is going through in, in the galaxy. So it's not global warming. It's not global warming. Yes, that does. There is a problem with that, but that's not <coughs> not the, the be all and end all of what's happening with the planet. The biggest issue is that our planet is going through an area which the Ponty call the zone. We are just on the edge of it right now, mm -hmm. which are these solar storms that are on the, on the edge because of this energy that's coming from the galactic center. It's changing the geo. It's it's fluctuating the geomagnetic you know, um, the magnetics of our sun. And our sun is changing and is having more and more these these flares. So our sun is changing, and and we our planet is getting bombarded. Um, our um, our magnetosphere of our planet is slowly collapsing. Okay, it's yeah. slowly collapsing. And That's you can why see the sun is going up. Exactly. That's exactly what we're seeing seeing here. And what they're afraid of is that it's going to get to the point where you know the, the our our magnetosphere is going to collapse enough that we're going to get bombarded with so much energies, and it's going to fry everything. Everything's going to get fried, all electronics. Um, that's one. That's one of the issues. That's one problem. But there's a lot more. I mean, basically, they they said that uh, the only safe place is to go underground. So um, that's a problem. The, the the earthquakes they're monitoring the earthquakes that are increasing all over the planet, and the the, the media is not talking about these things. There are mm -hmm. huge earthquakes that are happening all over the planet. There's shifts going on. They are seeing dormant volcanoes in the United States becoming becoming active again. Mm -hmm. So are going to something something's going to give. In addition to that, the the we're on a pole shift. We're going to have a, a pole shift very shortly, a physical pole shift. Mm -hmm. And if this actually occurs, it's actually going to change the tilt of the planet in regards to the spin. And it's going to cause, you have to understand, that the Earth is not circular. It bulges out because of the water. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you access, that bulge of water is going to get displaced, just like a gyroscope. And it's going to come, and we're going to have massive flooding. And the Ponte have warned, if you live on the coast, you may want to move. So there's a huge amount of things that they're watching. They okay. cannot rescue us. This is consistent with the visions that I've had since the late 80s. And at one point, I saw it in a loop where it would show me the whole cycle and then start over again. And um, in, in my visions, it starts with two of the calderas, the super volcanoes, going off in the United States. And then that starts a cascade effect. And the end result is the west coast of the Americas and Antarctica are on the equator. And that would put 
basically Saudi Arabia as the North Pole. And I didn't do the math to figure out where would be the South Pole. But the process, I have not seen a time frame for it. So I don't know when it's going to hit. But my Tiamat keeps telling me that my job is to make sure humans survive it. And the criteria I was given was you need to be above 1,300 foot elevation because that's where the splash is going to come to. Uh, you need to be more than 200 miles inland. And if, if the inland part yeah. is a valley, you need to be further than that. Um, that the splash is going to be horrific, but what it will do is basically scrape the land clean. There will be, when, when it flips, because that's like a 90 degree flip, there's going to be an yeah. earthquake like we have never seen in, in the lifetime of humanity. And everything's going to come crumbling down. So you need to be in a in a structure that is as earthquake resistant as you can possibly get it. So you don't want to be in a brick house. You want wood houses are actually better for it because they shift more. Yeah. And, and you need to have at least six months worth of food because once this hits all the supply chain is going to be gone and it it takes a good three to six months to grow enough food to survive on so you need you need food already for that growing period until you can get a good harvest and hope you can get a good harvest because when this flip happens all the nuclear power plants are going to explode. So you're not only going to have this volcanic winter, but you're going to have a nuclear winter on top of it. Okay, everything that happened at Fukushima, Fukushima and Chernobyl is going to happen at every single power plant that is operating. So this is a major big deal. You have to make sure that you are not going to be downwind from a power plant. And there are biological labs all over the planet. And when the power's down, the containment's going to be down. And so all of those bugs are going to escape. And I know there's one in in Kearney, Nebraska. There's one in Plum Island. There's one in in uh, Nigeria. Wuhan has one. Fort Detrick has one. These these are just the ones I know off the top of my head. There are any level four containment is going to go down be, when, when the power does. So though some of us have generators and we can keep using electricity until we run out of gas. Some of us know how to convert plastic back into gasoline so we'll have it longer than others. Those countries that have been taking our trash, they're going to have all that plastic to convert back into oil. And it's a simple matter of, of heating it to the right temperature. So. There's a lot of stuff that could have been done all along that hasn't been done. All of this plastic wastage, all of this one-time use plastic, one type, you can heat it and it turns back into oil. The other type, you heat it and it, it stays, in, it turns into a solid. The solids can be turned into bricks. They can be used for building roads, they can be used for for building fencing, housing. And we're coming to a point where all of this trash is going to become gold. Right. So there, 
-hmm. people need to think about the things you're going to need to survive are water first. You can only go three days without water. <clears throat> Food, shelter, warm clothing. And in summer, that's not a big deal. But if you've been in a temperate region and there's a pole flip and you're suddenly on a polar region, it's going to matter. <clears throat> okay, so you have to be prepared with all of those things. And you need to know how to do things without electricity. You know, it's only 200 years ago that, that w our entire technology was based on other stuff. So if you can learn the old skills that required hand tools or, or you know, burning kerosene, which you can get kerosene from melting plastic. So, you know, go back to the old skills from 200 years ago. No, we won't have computers. No, we won't have cell phones. No, we won't have stereos and all that. But we should still be able to survive and rebuild. And it's going to be more important than ever that we be what the Ponte called right-minded. Because we're going to have to deal not only with each other, all the people we think we don't like, but by that time, this, we will have had official first contact and there will be First Nations coming. There will be Star Nations coming and First Nations. The, the natives know how to survive. They've been doing it for millennia. I know that's, yeah. pro that probably sounds terrible, but they survived white people. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, they they survived white people. They can survive anything. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, these things are, the party have talked about it, they keep talking about it. Um, and that's why there's also these massive ships which are parked out in the uh, orbit of uh, Neptune, which are basically the equivalent of uh, Red Cross. And, but they know they, they can't rescue all 8 billion people on Earth. It's impossible. So, uh, but they have, star nations have been multiple times in our history come at these, these extinction level events to help relocate people to new areas so that, that the human population at that time had a chance, fighting chance to survive. This has happened before. Um, mm -hmm. It's the archaeoplanetography of the planet of these of these events and the star nations who assisted humans during those periods of time. Mm -hmm. So, and people under, that understand that I just I just dropped the word archaeoplanetography. Archaeoplanetography is the physical planet, the all the land mass on our planet actually tells a history of the planet. You see, if you, if you, see, if you look at a, 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 a pair, pair of place, you know, in the, in the Earth, and it looks like an elephant, it's not pareidolia. That is, that is archaeoplanetography. If you zoom out, you might see a picture of, of a person. You zoom out further, all of a sudden, now you see a different picture. But the more and more that you zoom in, the more and more of the detail of the history of 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 the planet, it, the whole planet's covered in archaeoplanetography, and yeah, the is. Ponte, the Ponte, and and the Ponte, um, you know, you can see that you know the the nations who actually helped move Americans from South America to North America during uh, one of these cataclysmic events. You know, the archaeoplanetography is there. The, the history of the planet is is written in the, in the face of the Earth. They have known that they've discovered archaeoplanetography on every single planet, every single moon, every single star that they have explored in the last three million years. 
Well, when the Guardians gave me the history of Earth from their point of view, they said that every 10 to 15,000 years that humans venture out into space, they become violent out there, and I can testify we have, that we, we humans become a threat to any species in our reach, which I can testify we have, and um, <clears throat> they come in and take advantage of a cyclic natural disaster to toss us back into the Stone Age, where hopefully the next time we'll be better people. Uh -huh. And they said that this disaster is preventable if we choose to become a level zero galactic civilization, which means we take care of every sentient being on the planet. And they defined sentience as being able to look in a mirror and know it was your own reflection. Know it's yourself. So that includes a lot of beings that humans won't consider their equals. But star nations would. Yeah. So um, that's, that's one of the things I'm supposed to be telling people about is that there will soon be a choice made whether to become a galactic level zero civilization or be tossed back into the Stone Age. And this is a choice that has to be made. So it's not all fear, doom, and gloom. There, if we choose to accept the Guardians as our racial parent and become a galactic level zero civilization, we will survive this. Mm. Nice to, hear there's, nice to hear there's hope. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, we are at yeah. the end of our time, so give me your links and I'll put them on all the places we share this so people can find you. Yeah. Uh, you can find Pyramids on Mars at PyramidsOnMars.com. <laughs> yeah, uh, you go there and uh, links to my CDs right there. Go to Bandcamp. You can uh, get, get physical CDs or digital. Everything is there. I've got, I've got three releases, Pyramids on Mars, Echo Cosmic, and Edge of the Black. So please go check those out. I also have online instructional guitar lessons. As you can find, there's links for those too that teach my uh, neoclassical style of uh, guitar playing. Please check it out. And um, I also have uh, my any other guitar players out there. I've got my my Neck Illusions DNA Double Helix design on my guitar. As you can see, oh, here we go. As you can uh, see the, de the design that that. Goes in between this the straps. Yeah, play in my in the back of my guitar is the DNA double helix. Can you see the detail on that? Yeah, I do. That's, That's a beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So I have that on sale too, and that's a Pyramid of Mars logo. So please go check that out. You know, and uh, support independent musicians. Yes. Support people that are not enslaved by the system. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We are free. Well, Penny, thank you so much for having me on uh, Flop and Pilot. I uh, I love our conversations. We had some good chatting, and uh, you know, I always learn. I'm always learning from you too. And I appreciate that. Well, I love you. You're one of my one of my besties. So when you said yeah. you wanted to be on, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking. 
And Thank you. for our audience, the show after this is called Goddesses and Devils with Katie Kamara and Amanda McManus, and it's worth watching. So thank you all very much. There you go. And we're all